I'm Reverend Greg and I welcome you to this video in the tutorial series Shaders for Hobby Programmers. As always, a short disclaimer first. This tutorial series is mainly for hobby programmers who struggle with understanding shaders. I'm not a professional programmer and I'm not very good at maths, so if you see any mistake in my video or see a better way to solve a problem, please add a comment so everyone can learn from you. In the last video we created a post-processing bloom effect on the whole application surface. We set the threshold to set what luminance values get bloomed and used an intensity value to set how strong the bloom is. The limitation was having only one threshold and effect intensity for everything on the screen. In the next video I'd like to improve that. We're going to create a bloom shader where each layer or depth range can have its own bloom settings. The only thing we won't be able to set for each layer is the blur size. We're going to do this by telling the shader to draw to multiple render targets. This means when drawing through this shader the image will be rendered normally to the application surface and at the same time rendered to the bloom surface using the luminance threshold from the last video. The biggest problem with multiple render targets however is this. Our shader is not going to run on mobile platforms and HTML. But let me show you why and why we're having this separate video first. So far every shader we created in this tutorial series was a GLSL ES shader. That's the Game Maker Studio's standard shader type when creating a new shader resource. In Game Maker Studio 2 we can manually set the shader type to normal GLSL or HLSL by right clicking the shader resource or the background of the shader editor. And in GMS1 we can set the shader type from within the shader editor. Here's some screenshots from the Game Maker Studio 1's and 2's documentation. As you can see not every shader type is supported by every platform, but GLSL ES is covering all platforms according to the documentations. I was told GLSL ES is not really running on Windows platforms, but Game Maker Studio is translating that into HLSL when compiling. I'm guessing GMS is doing the same for the Xbox and uh, PlayStation platforms, but I don't really know. If anyone knows for sure, please tell us in the comments. Me and probably other viewers would really like to know. So as long as we used GLSL ES in this tutorial series, we could be quite sure the shade is going to run pretty much anywhere. But here's the problem. According to the Game Maker Studio documentations, GMS1 is using GLSL ES version 1 and GMS2 is using GLS ES version 2. But multiple render targets, as I'm going to use in the next video, was only implemented in GLSL ES version 3. This was released in 2015 and obviously it's not supported by all devices yet and I guess that's why YoYo Games has not implemented version 3 into GMS2 yet. But if you're watching this video a few months or years from now, maybe you're in luck and can use multiple render targets in GLSL ES and Game Maker Studio. You can then probably just skip this whole video. At the moment, however, this means we need to learn a new shader language. For Windows platforms, we need to use HLSL, and for Linux and macOS, we have to use GLSL. Now, since GLSL is pretty much the same as GLSL ES, which is just an old and reduced version of GLSL anyways. There's not much to explain about GLSL for me. But since Windows, UWP and Xbox demand HLSL shaders, we definitely need to learn some more about those before the next video. So in this video, I'd like to show some basics about HLSL. I have to stick to basics because a few days before planning this video, I didn't even know all the stuff I just explained and didn't know how to build an HLSL shader myself. That said, if I make a mistake here, or if you have any tips, again, please share your thoughts in the comments beneath this video. I really like learning new things. So let's compare a GLSL ES pass-through shader, which we all very well know by now, with an HLSL pass-through shader. Here you can see the vertex shader code in both shading languages. I took SIGTHOP 3's HLSL 11 pass-through shader but change the names of the variables and the formatting a bit for easier comparison. I'll link to both in the description of this video. I have to mention that HLSL 9 might look different, but I simply don't know and didn't want to look into that as well. First, let's get a rough comparison of the different code blocks. You will see that they are pretty much the same in both languages. The first block in the GLSL ES shader code are the vertex attributes GMS passes into the shader with every draw call. The vertex attributes are the vertex position in world or room space, the vertex color, 
and the vertex UV coordinate on the texture page. On the right side in the HLSL shader we see something similar. A structure named Vertex Shader Input with the same data, position, color and texture coordinates. So these are the same as the vertex attributes in GLSL ES. The next block in the GLSL ES shader are the varyings, the variables that are passed on to the fragment shader. The varying vector for the interpolated vertex texture coordinates and the varying vector for the interpolated vertex color. On the right side we see another structure, this time called vertex shader output. Aside from the vertex color and texture coordinates, this output structure holds another variable called position. Why there is one more entry here I'm going to explain in a moment. For now let's just understand that these are the same as the varying in the GLSL ES shader. These are the variables passed on to the fragment shader. Now the third code block in the GLSL ES shader is the main function. In here the shader transforms a vertex position from world space to view space and sets both varying vectors for the vertex color and texture coordinates equal to the input vertex color and texture coordinates. The fragment shader will then receive the interpolated values per fragment. And on the right side we again see pretty much the same, a function in which the position is transformed from world space to view space and the shader output being set to the shader input. So the structure of these vertex shaders are pretty much the same. Now we need to understand the details a bit better, so let's go through these code blocks a bit more thoroughly. First the vertex attributes or vertex shader input. In the HLSL shade on the right we can see something called a struct. A struct is also called a data structure and is used in other programming languages like the C languages as well. It's quite different from the data structures in TML though. If you google a bit on data structures you'll find the same explanation over and over again. A data structure is a group of data elements grouped together under one name these data elements, known as members, can have different types and different lengths. So in this shader a new struct named vertex shader input is defined. We could name it differently though, in example we could call it vertex attributes. Note that unlike with functions, the closing curly bracket of the struct is followed by a semicolon to end the command line. It's not a function after all, it's more similar to defining a variable which we would end with a semicolon as well after all. Inside the brackets we then define the members of the data structure with their data type, member name and semantics. The first member is a float4. A float4 is the same as a vec4 in GLSL ES, so it's storing four floats. I named the member position but like in GLSL ES, you can name it whatever you want. And after the colon, we see the member's semantic called position, all uppercase. The main purpose of semantics is to link variables that are passed from program to program. So to link the variables, we should always make sure the semantics are the same in both programs. Now GMS sends the vertex position as x, y, z and w in world space to the variable with the semantics position uppercase. So we can't change the semantic of this variable. It always needs to be position. The second member is a float4 as well and is named caller. Its semantic is caller0. Again we can change the member's name but we need to use the semantic caller0 all uppercase to link the vertex caller. And the third member of the struct vertex shader input is a float2 and is named text chord. Its semantic is text chord 0 all uppercase and once more we could change the name but not the semantic. GMS will send the vertex's UV coordinates on the texture page to the variable with the semantic text chord 0. The tricky part to understand might be this. By setting up a struct we're not automatically creating a variable to save data. Vertex shader input is not a variable. We are basically creating a new data type called vertex shader input. If we want to store data, we still need to define and name a new variable of the data type vertex shader input. Now let's have a closer look at the struct vertex shader output. This is what gets passed on to the fragment shader. The second and third members first. 
Those are a float 4 called Collar and a float 2 called Textcode. They are the same as the variants in the GLSL ES shader, the fragments interpolated Collar and the UV coordinate passed on to the fragment shader. You probably noticed I named them the same as the variables inside the struct vertex shader input. This might look confusing, but once we're focusing on the main function, you'll see it's not confusing at all. But if you want to use other names like out collar and out text cord, you can do that. The semantic are the same as in the struct vertex shader input as well. But in here we could actually change the semantics. Because as long as we use the same semantics inside the fragment shader, the variables will be linked correctly. But of course we don't have to invent new semantics just because we can and using the same semantics makes it easier to read in my opinion. Now the first member might be strange coming from GLSL ES. It's a float 4 which I named position. To understand this we just need to understand what the fragment shader actually needs to know. The fragment shader of course wants the interpolated vertex color. The vertex is interpolated UV coordinates on the texture page and it actually also needs to know where to draw the fragment. So it needs to know the fragment's position on the render target, the surface or the screen. While the float fall position inside the input struct is for the vertex's position in world space, the float fall position inside the output struct is for the fragment's position in view space. The difference between GLSL ES and HLSL is just how that information is passed. In GLSL ES, inside the main function, we can see a built in variable called GL position. That's going to be passed on to the fragment shader as the fragment's position in view space. So in GLSL ES, this information is passed as a global variable and not as a varying. In HLSL, however, we need to pass it with the output struct. That's why the output struct has three members. Again, you could name it differently, like out position if you want to. The one thing we cannot change here though is the semantic. The position in view space always has to be passed on with the semantic sv underscore position or the fragment shader won't know where to draw the fragment. By the way there are other semantics starting with sv underscore and they all are reserved. So when you make up your own semantics never start them with sv underscore. Now let's finally have a look at the main function. In GLSL ES, everything we pass on to the fragment shader, we pass as either a built-in variable like GL position or a varying. This means the main function is not returning anything and that's why its data type is void. In HLSL, there's several different ways to pass data on to the next stage, but all of them include defining two variables with the data structures we just created the input and the output. The way I'm going to pass data to the fragment shader in this video is rather far from GLSL ES, but it's a quite common way in shader code examples. So in this version the data passed on to the fragment shader is the return value of the main function. We're going to pass a variable of the data type or struct vertex shader output, which means the return value of the main function needs to be of that data type as well. And that again means the main function cannot be void as in GLSL ES. It needs to be of the data type vertex shader output, the same as the return value. And as argument inside the brackets, we need to pass in the input. The input is of the data type vertex shader input and will name the argument input all uppercase. You can name that argument as you want, but I like to use input because it's easier for me to read the code like that. Inside the main function we now need to define a variable to return. As explained the return value will be of the data type vertex shader output and I'll name the variable output all uppercase for readability. The rest is pretty much the same as in GLSL ES again. We transform the position from world space to view space and store the new position in the data structure output.position. Then we store the input collar as output collar and the input texture coordinate as output texture coordinate. And finally by returning those three variables inside the output data structure we'll send interpolated values to the fragment shader. You can see addressing a variable of a data structure is simple. 
It's just the name of the data structure variable, in our case input and output, followed by a dot and the name of the data structure's member. So it's pretty much the same as in GML when addressing an instance variable of another object or instance. I at first had huge problems understanding this code because I don't have a programmer's background. But once you start working with it, it gets much easier. Also I had some help on the forums while preparing this video, so uh, thanks a lot to Binsk, Ghost in the IDE, Mishmash and the Stolen Battenberg. Without them I couldn't have done this video. If you're interested in other ways of writing your main function, here's a quick screenshot from the forums regarding this topic. Option 1 is what we just did. Option 2 didn't work for me and I didn't work harder to make it work. Option 3 worked and is a bit closer to GLSL ES. But now let's move on to the fragment shader. This should be much easier now. In GLSL ES we grab the variings with the fragments interpolated texture coordinates and the fragments interpolated vertex color. Here the variings from the vertex shader are linked to the variings in the fragment shader by their variable names. And in HLSL we grab the return value from the vertex shader's main function by setting up a new structure with the same members. A float 4 for the fragment's position in view space, a float 4 for the fragment's vertex color and a float 2 for the fragment's texture coordinate. Here the members are linked by the semantics, which means the members' names could differ from their counterparts in the fragment shader. I just picked the same names because I'm used to that. The struct's name is pixel shader input, but you can name it as you like. Doesn't matter at all. Now the main functions are very similar as well. In GLSL ES the main function again returns nothing, so the function's data type is void as it was in the vertex shader. Inside the main function we just get the fragment's color sample on the texture page, multiply it with the interpolated vertex color and store the result in the built-in variable glfrag color. In HLSL the fragment shader's output will be a color as well. And since like in the vertex shader we pass it on to the next GPU stage by returning a color, the main function's data type has to be a float4. Similar to the vertex shader, we'll pass in the input structure as argument and name it input all uppercase. We still need to link the return value to the next GPU stage. In the vertex shader, we added the semantic inside the data structure. But since we're not setting up an output data structure here in the fragment shader, we need to link the return value after the arguments. We'll need to use a built in reserved semantic called sv underscore target. In the next video we'll do this part a bit differently because in the next video we'll pass a data structure. But for most shaders the method shown here will be all you need to do to link the output. Now inside the main function we grab the fragment's color sample from the texture page, multiply it with the interpolated vertex color and return the result as a float4. In this example to grab a sample we're addressing the method sample of the object object. But I've also seen HLSL code that used a function called text2d to grab a sample instead, very much like we do in GLSL ES. I do not know the difference or if this is how it's done in HLSL 11 and the function text2d is for HLSL 9. If anyone knows, please leave a comment beneath this video, I'd really like to know and other videos might as well. But now it's time to create an example in code. We're going to create a pretty useless shader where we learn to use uniforms, varyings, additional textures and some basic things like calculating with vectors and functions. We're going to create several versions of this shader. One in HLSL for Windows based platforms, one in GLSL for Ubuntu and macOS and one in GLSL ES for Android, iOS and HTML. The shader we're creating would actually work in GLSL ES, so technically there's no need to use HLSL and normal GLSL since GameMaker Studio just translates a GLSL ES shader when not supported by a platform. But it's a simple way to show how we can control three shaders in three different shading languages and it's a good preparation for the next video. Also to actually see a difference between the shaders we're going to tint the image differently in each shading language. Like this we can confirm that when running the program it's actually using HLSL shader on Windows, GLSL ES shader on Android and the GLSL shader on Ubuntu. 
first we'll need an image and a mask. To not overcomplicate this video with remapping UVs, I want both to be in a separate texture page so their UVs go from 0, 0 to 1, 1. I'll just duplicate one of the images in the base project, rename it and set it to be on a separate texture page. Then I'll create a new sprite for the mask. This can be anything as long as there's large areas of black and white. Now that we have the sprites, let's continue with the object. I'll just duplicate the module template of the base project and rename it to Object Test HLSL GLSL GLSL Yes. And we'll need a test room. So let's create a child of the template room and name it Room GLSL Vertical Line GLSL ES Vertical Line HLSL. In here, we just need to place the new object on the main layer. And on the modifiers layer, we can stretch the kill modifier down and up to leave only one slider and no buttons. Next, we'll continue with the three shaders. This is the rather useless test shader we're going to create. We'll use the mask to decide whether a pixel should be desaturated. The white areas on the mask will desaturate and the blacks won't. The slider will set a uniform to decide by how much the image gets desaturated. Then we'll also tint the image based on the texture coordinates of the fragment. But to create our own varyings, we won't get that from the varying vector text code. We'll create a new varying just for the tint amount. To get an easy start, we'll do the GLSL ES shader first, since that's the shading language we use so far anyways. So let's create a new shader and name it Shader Test GLSL ES Tint Mask. As mentioned, I'd like to create a new varying for the tinting. Here's the preview from before again. As you can see, there's no tint in the upper left and full tint in the lower right corner. We could do that inside the fragment shader, but I'll do the calculations in the vertex shader already to show how to use varyings in HLSL later. This means we'll need to add a new varying float for the tint strength. And then we'll just set it to the multiplication of the vertex attributes intexcord.x times intexcord.y. Since we had set the sprite to be on a separate texture page, this means the upper left vertex's UVs will be 0, 0, and thus the tint strength will be 0. The lower right vertex's UVs will be 1, 1, and thus the tint will be 1. The other two corners will be 1, 0 and 0, 1, and thus their tint strength will be 0 as well. And every tint between the vertices will be linear interpolated. And that's all we need in the vertex shader. In the fragment shader, I'll start by splitting the GLFrag color line. Now the variables. We need to grab the varying for the tint. In GLSL ES, the varyings are linked by their name, so we need to name it exactly the same as in the vertex shader. We'll also need a uniform texture 2D for the mask texture we're going to use. I'm naming it Mask Sampler and a uniform float for the masking strength, so we can set how much the mask affects the desaturation. And as mentioned before, I want to use a different tint color on each of the three shaders to test if actually the correct shader code is running. So I'm going to create a constant VEC3 for the tint color and set it to red. Now we need to complete the main function. First we'll need the luminance of the mask and the luminance of the base color. To get the luminance of the mask, all we have to do is get any R, G or B value of the mask's texel color. In the last video, we learned we can use the function texture2d to grab a sample from the second texture as well. And since we made sure the texture coordinates of both textures are the same by setting both sprites to use a separate texture page, we can even reuse VV text code to get the sample on the mask texture as well without remapping the UVs. And to get the luminance of the base color, 
we'll just get the dot product of the base color and the anterior C vector as we did countless times in this tutorial series. Then we're going to tint and desaturate. To tint, we'll mix the base color with the tinted base color. And as mix amount, we'll use the varying float tint strength we grabbed from the vertex shader. So the lower right color will be fully tinted, the other corners will not be tinted at all, and all the other fragments tint will be interpolated. And to desaturate, we'll mix the base color with the base grayscale. The mix amount will be the mask luminance times the mask strength. So wherever the mask is black, the luminance is zero and thus the result is the original base color. Where the mask is white, the luminance is one. If mask strength is zero, the result will still be the original base color. But if mask strength is one, then the result will be the grayscale. This shouldn't be too difficult to understand by now if you followed this tutorial series. But if you feel like you're not quite understanding this code, check out the repetition videos in this playlist. They will give an overview of what we learned in what video. The second shader will be the GLSL shader. We can actually just copy the GLSL ES shader, rename it to shader test GLSL tint mask, and change the shader type to GLSL. All there's left to do in the vertex shader and fragment shader is change the description and the tint color. I'll pick blue for this shader. And that's it for the GLSL shader. There's one thing to mention though. GLSL has actually changed a lot since GLSL ES branched off. In newer versions of GLSL, we would use structs and layouts, or in and out instead of varying, and probably quite some more would be different. But I don't know what GLSL version is currently used by GMS 1 and 2, and I haven't learned the newer GLSL versions anyways. For now, however, let's just pretend GLSL is the same as GLSL ES, with just a few more features added. The third and last shader is the HLSL shader. This will be a bit more complicated and I'll take a bit more time to explain everything we need to change. But let's start by creating a new shader, naming it shader test HLSL tint mask and setting the shader type to HLSL 11. Unfortunately, GameMaker doesn't come with a pass-through shader code for HLSL. In the description of this video, you'll find a link to a thread on the GameMaker forums where Russell K and Xikthop3 show their pass-through shaders, and I also added a download link to my version of the pass-through shaders, which are actually derived from those on the forums. Feel free to use any. So to start, I'm just pasting my version of the pass-through shader to the vertex shader. In the GLSL ES version, all we did was adding a varying for the tint strength. As explained, we're not using varyings in HLSL though. To pass data to the fragment shader, we need to add a member to the output struct. So the value passed will be a float as well. And I'll call it tint strength. The semantics we can call whatever as long as we don't start with SV underscore. So let's just call it whatever. And inside the main function, we pretty much copy what we did in GLSL. We're setting the output tint strength to the product of the input text code X and Y. Vertex shader done, now the fragment shader. Of course, we'll need to grab the tint strength inside the input struct now. The float tint strength with the semantics whatever. Then we will need to get the second texture in, the mask texture we created a few minutes ago. This is unfortunately much more complicated than uh, GLSL ES and I can't explain much here because I don't understand it really. First we need some kind of object for the texture and we can do that by declaring a variable of the data type texture2d with a capital T. Naming the texture to whatever you like, I picked mask texture and then register it as texture1. One. 1, because 0 is the GM-based texture object GameMaker Studio prepares for us anyways. Then we need to create a sampler by declaring another variable, but this time of the data type sample state. Name it as well. I picked mask sampler here. 
and register this as sampler1 so it's linked with texture1. Sampler0 again is set up by GameMaker Studio and is called GM Base Texture. With those two variables set up, we will be able to grab samples from the mask texture. Now the uniform mask strength will use to set how much the mask will affect the desaturation. This line is exactly the same as in GLSL ES code, so we can just copy that. And then the constant. It's pretty much but not quite the same. We need to use a qualifier static const instead of just const. And of course it's not a VEC3 but a float3. Also, to make this shader tint in another color than the other two shaders, I'll also set the color green here. Next is the main function. I think here it's easiest to just copy paste the GLSL ES code to the HLSL shader and change them line by line. To get the mask texture sample, we'll use the same syntax as with the base color. This time the texture object is what we defined as texture2d and registered to texture1 in the header. That was the variable mask texture. Then we use the method sample as well to get a sample from that texture. The sampler will be what we defined as sampler state and registered to sampler1. That was the variable mask sampler. And finally the texture coordinates. Input text code. And we only need one color channel to get the luminance since the mask is just black or white anyways. On the next line we get the luminance of the base color. We can use the dot function in HLSL as well and the syntax is the same. So all we need to change here is the constructor of the anti -SC vector. It's a float3 in HLSL instead of a vec3. Then the tinting line. The mix function is called lerp in HLSL. The syntax of the function is the same though. So all we need to change is the name of the variable for the tint strength because here we named that variable just tint strength. But we also need to refer to the input struct where that variable is stored. We can use the variable input because we declared it here in the main function as an argument of the data type pixel shader input, which is the struct in the header. Note that we're multiplying the float3 base color.rgb with the float3 tint call. This works the same as in GLSL ES. Adding, subtracting, multiplying and dividing work component wise. So the result of base call.rgb times tint call will be a float3 constructed from base call.r times tint call.r and base call.g times tint call.g and base call.b times tint call.b. And the same goes for calculating a float3 with a single float. Base call.rgb plus 0.5 would be a float3 with the components red plus 0.5, green plus 0.5 and blue plus 0.5. In this shader we use two functions, dot and lerp. You've seen those two work pretty much the same as in GLSL. The same goes for other functions. They're in HLSL as well. Smooth step is exactly the same and so is pow for power. Fract is there too, but it's called frac and length and distance are available as well. So all functions we used in GLSL ES so far are here too. In the description of this video, I added several links to MSDN where you can read more about shader models and functions as well as a reference GLSL to HLSL and the HLSL syntax if you need to know more about HLSL. And while I'm at it already, let me show a bit more about addressing vector or float components. In GLSL we can construct a VEC3 from one component only. So an example, if luminance is a single float of 0.5, then VEC3 luminance will result in a VEC3 where all three components are set to 0.5. We can do something similar in HLSL as well. We'll construct a float3 from luminance.xxx. 
means we're setting 3 times the first component of luminance and since luminance is a single float of 0.5, the result is a float 3 with just 0.5, 0.5, 0.5 as well. Of course then we could skip the constructor float 3 altogether, since luminance.xxx already is a float 3. This works in HLSL as well as in GLSL. But we can apply this technique to hard-coded numbers as well, not just to variables. So in GLSL we'd in example write vec3 all point 2 and we will get a vec3 with all components set to 0.2. In HLSL we can write 0.2f and then .xxx. So we declare 0.2 as float and grab the first component three times. And we can do this without the constructor even since the .xxx already makes it a float 3. Also swizzling works exactly the same as in GLSL. If you want to swap the red and blue channel of the float 4 base color, you can write base call dot red blue equals base call dot blue red. One big difference in HLSL is this though. In GLSL the result of calculation to the right of the equal sign has to be of the same data type as the variable to the left of the equal sign. So this would not work and throw an error instead. Base call dot red blue equals base call dot green. In HLSL however this works component wise again. In GLSL you'd of course just set base call dot rb to base call dot gg. But enough of that and back to our code. The last thing we need to do here is desaturate the image based on the mask's luminance. So again we need to change mix to lerp and change the vec3 base lum to base lum dot xxx. But actually we can do this even a little bit shorter. In GLSL functions we often can't mix data types. That's why we had to construct a vec3 from the float base lum. In HLSL, however, functions do work component-wise when mixing data types. So we don't even need to construct the float 3, we can just write base lum and it will mix with the base color.rgb component-wise. So that's it for the shaders. We now got a useless shader in GLSL ES, GLSL and HLSL with the only difference of the tint color. Now all we need to do is code the object and run this on Windows, Android and Ubuntu. In create event we can remove the three regions information, resize and mockup. We won't need those in this tutorial. Then I'll quickly write the title and info text as usual. In the sprite and shader region I'll set up the main sprite and mask sprite we created at the start of this video. Now we need to check whether a shader is compiled or not. We want to use HLSL or normal GLSL if they're supported and if not use GLSL ES and if even that is not working we're not using any custom shaders at all so I'm going to nest some ifs for this. First let's check if the HLSL shader is being compiled. If it is compiled I'm setting an info text about the shader type so we can display that later in draw event and I'm setting the shader variable to the HLSL shader resource. But if the HLS shader was not compiled, we're doing the same with the GLSL check. And if that fails, then the GLSL ES check. And finally we catch the case where no shader was compiled. Now if shader is not minus one, we can set up the uniform handles and the mask sprite texture ID.
Note that the mask sampler needs to get the same uniform name as we set in HLSL. Inside the HLSL fragment shader we had set up two variables to get the samples. One was the texture object we named mask texture and the other was the sampler we named mask sampler. We don't need a handle for the texture object but we do need one for the sampler. The rest I'm adding to create event is just to construct some info text and not needed for the shaders to work. I want to display which OS we're running the program on and what shader type is running. And I want to set up the single slider we left in the test room to change the mask strength. I'll name the slider Masking, turn off the automatic drawing of the slider value, and set the starting value to zero so the slider is all the way to the left. As so often in this series, we won't need the step event and can just delete it. Now, finally, the draw event. This code just sets the shader based on the compile checks we did in create event, draws the sprite, resets the shader, and then draws the module frame and title text of the test module. We need to change this a bit though. First we need to check if any of the shaders compiled before setting the shader. Then we also need to set the uniforms and the texture stage. To set the mask strength, I'll just grab the slider value ranging from 0 to 1. So if a shader was compiled, this code is setting up the shader program we selected in create event, sets the variables, draws the sprite and resets the shader. And if no shader was compiled, it just draws the sprite and resets the shader to the built-in default shader anyways. Unlike with surfaces, we can reset the shader even if we hadn't set a custom shader before. That's all now, so let's run this on Windows. As you can see, the title text of the module shows we're running this on Windows. So the HLSL shader was compiled and thus the tint is green. If we move the mask slider, the white areas of the mask desaturate the image. So this works as expected. Now let's run this on Ubuntu. Here you can see the title text states the OS is Linux. So the HLSL shader was not compiled, but the GLSL shader works. And we can confirm that since the tint is blue now. And if we run this on my tablet, you can see the title text saying Android and the color is red. So this means both HLSL and GLSL were not compiled, but GLSL ES is running now. One last important thing, and that's actually something we're going to do in the next video. On Windows, we can actually run GLSL ES and HLSL in the same game, since GameMaker Studio translates GLSL ES to HLSL anyways. And the same goes for Ubuntu, we can run GLSL ES and normal GLSL in the same game. So that's it for today's tutorial. This should help if you're used to GLSL ES but want to create an effect that can only be done in HLSL or GLSL. I hope you enjoyed learning more about shaders. If you need more examples, check out Sigthop 3's free HLSL shaders on the marketplace. I linked three of those in the description of this video and they really helped me in preparing this tutorial. Until next time.